So today I'm just going to give you a brief overview. So despite what Travis said in terms of putting us to the wall and giving us results, um, there isn't actually a whole lot of information that's out, coming out of Kepler yet because we're still early days. We don't have enough progeny to do what, to, for me to stand up and make any scientifically defendable statement yet. Um, but we do have information from a whole lot of previous work that we've done, which I think um, you'll find interesting. And Franzi Vike is going to be presenting that. Um, go easy on her. It's the first time she's ever presented to a farmer audience, and there's quite a few in the audience, so she's getting nervous. Um, so, yeah. I am just going to work out how to do this. Um, so, really, just a brief overview of. So we've got a, a, um, a program in beef genetics which is called Informing New Zealand Beef, so INZB. When we talk about INZB, that's, that's what we're talking about. Um, it's co-funded by the Ministry for Primary Industries, so um, they have been um, kind enough to put some significant funding into this alongside um, your levy funding. So there's, there's a bunch of different parts of the program, and I'm not really going to go through all of, all of that, but today we're essentially talking about um, the beef progeny test, um, and as part of that we've also got part of the program that is um, looking at how we can um, help commercial farmers um, start to record information on their animals and get genetic information back. And um, we just put out a call for expression of interest for that part of the program, and, and we wanted probably about 10 or 12 farmers to work with and we had about 50 put up their hands, or more than 50, so, um, so there's, there's a really good response happening to that. Um, <clears throat> other parts of the program is looking at the economics under New Zealand conditions and developing New Zealand specific indexes. Um, we will do some, some work in um, new traits um, and we're just sorting out what we're going to do. We'll talk, we won't talk a lot about that but I'll mention one or two things. Um, and then the rest of it is um, data management infrastructure and um, industry um, information, I guess. Put packaging information, um, putting it out there and working out how we can do that um, better. So that's the program in a nutshell, but yeah, really here, we're here today to talk about um, the progeny test work that's happening um, at Kepler. So the goals of what we're trying to do here um, there's about three or four main goals of it. Um, and really, actually, it's providing the data that can be an infrastructure for doing um, a cross-breed evaluations um, and um, for being able to um, make good comparisons of animals. Um, and that's not always that exciting to do. Like, we run a, in sheep, we run a central progeny test that's been going for 25-odd years. Um, and it's not necessarily... Um, exciting in terms of new information coming out um, but in, in sheep, um, but it provides the core basis for being able to um, run the sort of um, evaluations that we do. And to some extent um, this progeny test is more exciting, um, but it's still that underpinning data infrastructure that we need is, is really one of the goals. Um, of course along the way we actually get some really good data on, indus on leading industry bulls um, and um, and that includes collection of carcass data, um, and all our carcasses are normally graded through the Silver Fern Farms Beef EQ, Beef EQ program, and we've been working with Silver Farms on that for um, uh, quite a few years. I think our first, first calves from the old, old program that we had were born in 2015, so um, we've been grading carcasses and, and getting that data for quite a long time now. Um, I've said here also another goal is to demonstrate the power of crossbreeding. So, and I'll use the word demonstrate quite um, specifically um, because we know that actually crossbreeding works, right? That's, that's been known for a long time. Um, but because the design that is, is that we need to, um, we need to have these crossbred animals, um, it's actually a really good opportunity to remind ourselves of actually what these, um, what a crossbred can actually do and the power of, um, of hybrid vigour. And actually, finally, having a, a cattle resource like this actually gives us um, a bunch of animals that we can um, investigate new traits, um, potentially roll them out. So, um, for example, uh, some of the heifers um, are going to go for a month's holiday up to Invermay in winter. Um, 
and at Invermay they're actually going to put them through and Suzanne, I saw a work, oh there she is, uh, walked in before, um, Suzanne's here, um, she's going to have those heifers um, go up there for a month and is going to put them through um, what is a, a, a methane accumulation chamber, so it's a way of, of measuring methane and then also look for some um, some easier ways of doing it, some proxies for methane measurements. So, um, so a resource like this lets us do stuff like that. Um, I know methane's a bit of a buzzword or a trigger point for some people, um, but it's something that we've got to do as, as part of this program, but we're also looking at other things. So like last week we were up looking at um, the potential to use um, some of those, the new tags that are being used in, in dairy cows as to how we could use them to get um, some better reproductive performance data. Um, things like age at puberty, um, postpartum anesthesia, which is the time that's taken be between calving and, and starting to cycle again um, and getting a very good um, idea of when, when the cow actually conceives. So we're going to be looking at, at new things like that and, and animals like this um, help us do some of that stuff. Um, and we can also work in, in industry herd as well. So our program, there's actually two sites to this program. Um, obviously Kepler, where we are down here, um, and we've got a, a new site um, at um, Lock and Bar Station um, up on the Napier Taupo Highway, um, which is owned by Rimanui Farms. And that we've only just commenced the matings um, at that this year, or last year I suppose technically. No, it was actually this year, because, literally this year, because they, they mate very late. Uh, they mate in, um, in mid-January. Um, and so that has come on board and that will allow us to test more bulls, um, but also to bring Simmental into the program um, as well. So up there we've got Angus Hereford and Simmental bulls and they're all going over Angus cows, whereas down here we've got um, Angus and Hereford in a full cross design, which is what I'll talk about for a minute. Um, so I'll just talk about the design and then Anna's going to tell you all the detail about what actually happens on the ground and the measurements that, that we take. Um, so this is the, the design at Kepler. So basically, um, before we started this program, Kepler had an Angus herd and we, um, someone that Beef and Lamb, before I was actually working for Beef and Lamb, Beef and Lamb came to me and said, uh, what would we ideally do if we wanted to create the ideal situation to do the, to achieve the goals that we wanted? And I said, well, ideally you'd actually get an Angus, a bunch of Angus cows and a bunch of Hereford cows, and you'd have them running alongside each other in the same herd, and you'd record them and you'd mate them both ways. So Angus bulls over Angus cows and Angus and Hereford cows, and the same Hereford bulls over both breeds as well. Um, when Palmy got involved, um, it's, it's not a common situation to, to find out there. A, a herd that's going to run two purebred herds alongside each other and then do all that crossing. Um, Palmy said, right, we'll make this happen. Um, and so um, really do have to take our hats off to Palmy um, and Travis and his team for, for making that happen. So um, Travis went out and, and bought um, a whole lot of um, Hereford heifers, which were from mainly mainly from recorded heifers. Um, some of them were commercials, but but from Hereford commercial herds associated with Hereford studs, um, and brought those in. So first year, Travis, what did we bring in? About 200, was it? 150, something like that, Herefords to put alongside another 150 Angus, and then he went back out and brought another bunch the next year. I can't remember how many, but we ended up with about 500. The AI across both breeds, so it must have been about 250 Herefords. Um, so yeah, so that's that's the design of what we want to do. Um, and so we first AI'd those cows um, two years ago, three years ago. Um, and the first lot of steers um, are about to be killed in the next couple of months um, before their second winter. There's still only about 50 or 60 steers in that group, um, and, and, uh, and their sisters obviously, um, so we're just building numbers um, still in terms of the data that's come right through um, the whole thing. We're taking a whole lot of measurements, I won't talk about them because Anna's going to talk about them in a minute. Um, and so what I will tell you is why we want to do that 
that cross or, or what, it, what it tells you. And it's actually called a dial L cross is the science term. So um, it means you're crossing both ways. So this might be the sort of results we might get for a trait. And actually, um, I haven't, I quite deliberately haven't put what the trait is here because this could be weaning weight, in which case you'd say, oh, well, we're showing that one breed's better, higher than the other, or it could be birth weight, in which case you're showing one breed's higher than the other. So it doesn't actually matter which trait we're talking about, just trying to get at the principle. So you're going to have um, some, some straight Angus calves and some straight Hereford calves, and you're going to have some Hereford Angus calves and some Angus, Angus cross Hereford calves. So they cross the other way. So pretty obviously that will give you some information. Um, and it will give you information on what's the difference for whatever trait we're talking about between Angus and Hereford. So that's one piece of information we need. Um, but there's more information in here. So if we then took halfway between the Angus and Hereford cross and we compared that to the average of these crossbreds, what's that telling you? Easy question, there's no, no hard answers here. Someone can tell, someone can yell out and say. Hybrid vigour, yeah. So that's your hybrid vigour. People actually often talk about that slightly wrong in the industry. They often say, oh, I've got these calves, um, I've got these, say, Angus cows, and I put a, let's say, a Chirolet bull across them, and look at the hybrid vigour. Um, yes, you'll have hybrid vigour in there, but you've also got the breed difference. Um, between the Angus and, and, and the Chirolet in that case, for example. So um, the hybrid vigour is actually technically, it's the amount of extra performance you get over and above the average of the two breeds. Um, so, so when you get that first cross, it's not all hybrid vigour, it's partly, it's half of its, or well, probably more than half actually, is, is, is a breed difference. Um, and then the hybrid vigour is the, the icing on the cake, the cream on top of it. But it's really important and it's, and it's well worth having. In fact, people talk about it's the only free lunch that you're going to get in farming sometimes. So that's our hybrid vigour. But there's one more piece of information that we can get here. So we've got two crosses, Hereford by Angus and Angus by Hereford. What's the difference between those two, the performance of those two groups of calves due to? So they've both got 50-50 Angus Hereford genes in the calf, right? Well, what's the difference between the two groups? Coming from the female side, right? So, and it's really essentially what we call the maternal ability of those two breeds. Um, so whatever this trait was in this case, um, by coincidence I happen to put Angus as, as higher than, or Hereford cross Angus, so Hereford bull cross an Angus cow, as slightly um, higher average than Angus cross Hereford. So you would say this would be, in this case, an advantage, um, the maternal advantage that an Angus cow might bring. Now, sorry to the Hereford breeders in the room, I could have turned that upside down. It would have, been the, would have said the same, same thing. Um, it's, so, it's, so what we're actually trying to do is disentangle all the little bits of that cross. Um, and that's how we do it, is by having those two, or well, those four different um, types of cross. So that's essentially what we're trying to achieve here. On this, on this cross here, um, so the bull, so you think about in terms of both of those calves are 50-50 Hereford Angus. One's coming from the Angus, Angus side, one's coming from the Hereford side. So the calf is actually essentially the same genetics I get what you're saying. So we're adjusting for bulls. So yes, yeah, like we're using a bunch of bulls in doing this. Um, and then, you know, if we knew where those bulls sit in the whole population, then we sort of we can pin that against the population as well. I think that's what you're you're asking, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yes, the bull is important. Um, and as a geneticist, I'm never going to say all Angus bulls are the same or all Hereford bulls are the same because I know full well that they're not. Um, yeah, but we. We, we put the ball into the, into the model. I'm just sort of not just talking about the big picture here. Yep. Um, so that's the maternal difference and what comes from the cow. 
And so this is a what do we expect to find, and you know, someone could have given you this table 30 or 40 years ago, so this is just expectation as to what we normally see, um, but people don't always understand this. So I've just said, okay, there might be three categories of traits here. There's, there's growth, carcass, and reproduction. The heritability of those traits is really how much the genetics of um, selection operates within a breed on those traits, right? How accurate we can get or how big a difference you might get between bulls. So growth, moderately, moderate to high heritability, you can certainly change growth by selection programs, right? You get moderate hybrid bigger for growth. Normally about a 5%, 5 to 10% advantage, remembering it's that advantage over the, medium, the middle of those two breeds. Um, for carcass, those traits tend to be really highly heritable. Um, and don't worry, it's my last, my last slide, Anna, I'll sit down in two secs. Um, the high heritability traits, things like marbling and that sort of thing, um, they actually tend to have a much lower amount of hybrid vigour. It's just the way it is. Um, traits like reproduction and maternal ability, uh, which tend to be low heritable, hard to change through selection, whoops, tend to be high in hybrid vigour. So where, where does hybrid vigour give you the most benefit? In your cow herd, right? If you can have crossbred cows or get that hybrid vigour in your cow herd, um, that's really where you start to hum. Um, but you do still get hybrid vigour for growth and, and other traits. that It still exists, it's just not quite as, as much. So at that, I will... And I think we're having questions at the end of these three, aren't we? I'm sorry. I'll pass straight over to Anna here. So I am Anna Boyd, I'm the Genetics Operations Specialist for Beef. Uh, in terms of this program, I am the Operational uh, Lead or Project Lead. So I make sure that things happen when they should. Um, and, you know, obviously resources are on farms such as visual tags. I also work alongside uh, the AI company, breeding centres, any other contractors that we use uh, for any measurements that are needed on farm. So I have the easy presentation for today, so I'm going to cover what we measure on farm when we do that, and a little bit about the how. So I thought I would start off with how we actually select the size that we use for AI. So as Jason mentioned, the first mating was in 2020. That year we actually used link size. So a link size is a size that's already been used, so or used in multiple herds. So it's the bull himself, it's not the, su the sons of that bull. So the first year what we did is we used link size that had been used in the original beef progeny test. Jason's touched on this already and Franzi will talk about this, uh, the results from that after myself. But what I also had to do, because that first year they were maiden heifers, these were bulls we still had straws in storage. What we often do is when we collect, we always collect more than we need. So I went through everything we had, made sure they were heifer appropriate, and then I approached the breeders to make sure that they were okay that we used those straws at Kepler. So that's how we started. Then in the next two AI matings, what we did is we resorted back to what we would normally follow for the progeny test. So in June, each year we put a call out for bull nominations. So in this, in this progeny test, obviously to the Hereford and Angus breeders, they can put forward a bull or bulls of their choice, hopefully the best bulls they have, and then we go through a nomination or a selection process. So the selection criteria that we do follow for the crossbreed progeny test, so we do want bulls that are used by more than one breeder. It doesn't mean that we wouldn't put a bull in that hasn't, but it's definitely something we're, that we're after, because what that means is then that bull is linked to multiple herds. Bulls that are used in international projects, so that allows the collaboration. So if we've got a bull used in Australia, we use his straws over here, we can combine that data for any future evaluation. Bulls offering our diversity and breeding objectives, so that in itself allows more studs to be involved because they all do have slightly different objectives within their herd. Bulls with attributes that offer something to the New Zealand industry, so something that aligns with, with a commercial beef breeder, be it uh, carcass, or meat quality, uh, growth, calving ease. So we want to make sure that we do cover a range of breeding objectives in that. 
and then bulls that will obviously help the participating herds achieve their goals. So that's Kepler to achieve whatever they were already achieving on a farm, but hopefully better, because we're using some really, really good bulls, but as well as Lock and Virat now too. Just on the side here is an example of, of one of the lists that we have available on our website. So I do encourage you to go on and have a look. You just, uh, I'll show you at the end where you can find that. So this was obviously the third cohort, so last mating. And as you'll see there, we've got a mixture of Angus and Hereford, and then the Simmental that were only used at Lock and Virat. So I'll start off with kind of the obviously mating then we move through. So first year as I mentioned 2020, 302 maiden heifers. Uh, that year was 14 link size so it was evenly split, split between the Angus and the Hereford. 2021 was just shy of 500 so you were close Jason. And as I mentioned that year was the first year that these were nominated bulls. So we had 10 new AI bulls evenly split again. Each year you'll see here, we do use link sires to the previous mating. So that enables us to combine the data. And uh, this last mating just in December, we mated 405, 13 new AI bulls, and, and that was an international Angus as well. Uh, so then this year we also had mated the, the 2021 born heifers. So those were the first cohort born to AI. For the heifers that are born to progeny test sires, they are naturally mated for the first two years because what that allows us to do is to evaluate the fertility traits. So is she getting in calf? How early is she getting in calf? So this is the first year that happened on farm and you'll see these girls when you're walking up to the yards today, they're an amazing nick. We structurally assessed them this morning and, and Bill was very impressed. So just to, and I also just included, so you could have a look, a look particularly uh, with condition score, Franzi is going to be focusing on this in her presentation about how important condition is when they go to the bull. And I really wanted to show you how like, well these girls are, you know, how well conditioned they are when they go to the bull. The farm team here does an amazing job at making sure they're up to condition. And another one just of, of value probably to you as well is how heavy these girls are when they're maiden heifers. So when they're yearlings going to the bull, and you can see this down here, so, you know, they were screaming. In terms of the AI pr uh, program, it's a three yarding program. So they come in three times. First time is to get the cedar insert. Uh, this is when we often take the mature cow weight and condition score as well, body condition score. They then come in again for the cedar pull, and then they come in the day of the AI uh, program itself to be. So each time they do get a, hor a hormone injection, we often we will AI the girls that are cycling first. The ones that aren't cycling in the morning, they'll get an extra jab, and then we'll do them later on, so they've got more of a chance to cycle if they're going to cycle. The cows are pre-allocated to the bull. Um, it is all very streamlined. It sounds very scary, but um, Jason will, talk, uh, will often say that even the managers on the original sites were all a little bit hesitant about AI on their, on their commercial properties before they started, but then especially as you keep going year by year, and I mean Simon's here today as well, so he'll be able to vouch for that, hopefully, but the cows do get used to it. Obviously heifers are a lot easier because they don't have calves on them, but the cows do come through the yards, and hopefully Travis agrees as well after three matings in terms of AI. Just nod, Travis. Thank you. <laughs> and um, the other measurements we record is, as I mentioned, cow mature weight and cow body condition score. So this is a 1 to 10 scale, 1 is fully emaciated, 10 is morbidly obese. Um, I've trained up a couple of the farm staff, or one in particular, so that she can do that if I can't make it down. And it's the same scale that the New Zealand dairy industry uses. Um, so that was just to show you the condition. So then on to pregnancy testing. So each year we do obviously preg tests, we do obviously pregnant, not pregnant, but then we also fetal age. But just to show you uh, what we had in calf to AI, so the first year we were a little bit lower, um, but then we obviously did, we did increase, which is great. This is what we got uh, the last year, or just, just been actually, so we pre-tested two weeks ago. To get 69% in uh, the rebreeding heifers is, is, is through the roof. So uh, Jason will often say, often say with AI, we aim for 50%, anything, well, 60% is good. Anything above 60% is great. So to get 69 is just, we're really, really pleased with that. It means we're going to have more calves on the ground by the size. 
And then I also just included, so you can see, just overall in calves. So this is including the cows that get pregnant to the natural mate bulls as well. The bulls that are used to follow are bought at the farmer's discretion. So they're there to do a job and tail up. But you can see, you know, and this all comes back to that condition. These girls are, are ready to go and, and the bulls that are, that are doing their job at the end. So with the fetal age, what the fetal age is, so we've been fetal aging the natural mate calves because obviously the cows that are in calf to AI will be that 80 days or whatever it is. And then we're, we are fetal aging the natural mate calves to five day increments. What this allows us to do is to, to know when the cow is con conceived by estimating the age of the fetus. The replacement uh, heifers, have, as I already covered, are naturally mated for the, the first two years. So it allows us to look into her fertility as a yearling and then re-reading as a two-year-old. Other measurements that are taken at pregnancy testing, we will grab an 18-month weight of those PT um, heifers coming through. Cow body condition score again. And then we'll also tissue sample any new, bull, uh, new cows that are coming into the program. So the next lot of measurements are taking pre-calving post-winter. So we take a mature cow weight again on, on the females and also another body condition score. And then on the, the animals that are born to progeny test size, we also grab a yearling weight at this point of time and a hip height. So this is um, from Mendip actually, Simon, and uh, we've got Craig here. So we, what we do is we take the measurement from between the hip bones and uh, that is, we subtract it from the, the height of the crush and then work out the, the hip height of the cow. We take a hip height on the female progeny three times. So as yearlings, then as two-year-olds, and then as three-year-olds. Then we go through to calving. So calving, here uh, we actually are grabbing a birth date. This hasn't been the case at the original progeny test sites or Lockenville, but what it's enabling us to do is to compare the fetal age to what the actual birth date of the, the calf is. So Franzi um, has actually just, just completed a paper on the fetal age and, and birth date, and G as well. So if you wanted to ask either of them any questions, they are both here. So Bella goes around um, on a daily basis, maybe twice a day, and just um, attaches that birth date to the cow tag. We then do a calving assistance score, so that's a one to five score. You may not be able to see uh, it down here, but one is unassisted and far and well, we do it for one to five, but there is a six, but six is uh, elective surgical, so hopefully we're not doing any of those. Uh, so one is unassisted, two is easy pull, three is hard pull, four surgical assistance, and five is a male presentation, so that is a calf that is coming out backwards. She's not actually punished for that, but we do record it. We do make sure that all cows do have an assistant score because if she doesn't have one, and you'll see, probably see down here, it uh, won't be interpreted, note that a blank score will not be interpreted as unassist, un, unassisted, it will be interpreted as just not being scored. So we do make sure that we attach a score to that cow. And then Bella also notes down any deaths and uh, samples the calf as well. So these photos, this was the first uh, calf born to the progeny test. So Travis took the, this photo for us. It's a bit of a, a social media star for a little while. I think, Bella, this was the first calf this year? Yeah. Yeah, and then I just was trying to get a little bit of breed representation in here, so I didn't get told off for putting too many Herefords in there. Uh, then we go through to calf marking. So at calf marking, again, we grab a mature, cow mature weight, we don't do a body condition score at this point of time because it is quite close um, to mating. We obviously tag the calves with a very visible progeny test tag. Uh, we grab a sex and we take the ear tissue DNA sample at this point of time as well. I've just noted here too that we do actually uh, tag the first calving heifer's calves. So these girls that you'll be seeing today when they calve, even though they're two natural bulls, we still tag them and grab the calves' weight at calf marking at wean and weaning. 
once we grab that weaning weight of the calves of the first calvers, they can go back into the commercial herd. This contributes to her performance as a female and, and milking ability. Then through to weaning, again, the cows get a lot of love in this program. So we'd grab another mature cow weight and a condition score. Uh, we obviously grab the weaning weight of the calves. We do, do a docility score, so this is a one to five scale. Uh, one is very docile, and then a five is aggressive. So it's all, uh, it's all done in the crush, ideally when they're not head bailed. So you kind of do it based on how much they're like flicking their tail, if they've got their head raised. You know, fives are obviously snorting and frothing and trying to kill you from the crush. So, you know, it's uh, quite easy to do, and this is when it should be done. A lot of people tell me that they uh, do docility scoring their herd, but then I ask when they do it, and they tell me they do it on their cows. This is obviously before these animals have had any influence from management. So you're doing it when they're fresh off mum, so this is going to be like their genetic contribution to, to, to docility. So it's the best time to do an animal. They'll obviously keep showing up, so this is going to be the female that is trying to jump out. At, you know, later on, but this is the ideal time to do it. So if you want to, want to start docility scoring, scoring, try to do it on your calves at weaning. Other measurements, we've got ultrasound muscle scanning. So this is a picture of Bill here doing that. So eye muscle area, rib, fa rib fat, rump fat, and intramuscular fat. We grab an 18 month weight at this time point. A structural assessment scores other measurements as well. So Bill, Judy, myself and a couple of farm team were doing that for three hours in the freezing cold this morning, so it was fun. And obviously Bill's going to give you a demonstration later on. Pre-slaughter weight before uh, they go on their merry way to the plant. And then carcass data. So we get carcass weight, dressing out percentage and uh, beef EQ data that Jason touched on previously. So as I mentioned, I just wanted to, I really encourage you to go on just to see, you know, what, who we're using, so what bulls we're using, you know, where, they, where they're coming from. Um, but then there's also reports that we put out on the data. So we've got a lot of reports from the original quantity test and eventually we will have them from, from the crossbreed as well. So if you go on to beef and lamb genetics, we've got um, this, where that circle there is where the lists are. And then if you go to here, the Informa New Zealand Beef tab, this is where you can find out more about the program, more about the projects. So have a look and um, thank you. That's me. Thanks very much, Anna. Frame size. So we, we haven't quite, uh, well, Jason, but uh, so eventually we, you know, there might be something we look at where we can, we haven't done anything with it yet. We've recorded it, but we may combine look at combining hip height with cow BCS with cow weight and see if we have a cow size index or you know something there. So haven't done anything with it yet, but yeah. So prime size. A lot of these places, uh, the original progeny test, these were big commercial properties, so we were never going to ask people to pick up calves. It's a, it's a different ball game. So, and then it would change the system as well because a lot of these cows carve out on the hills. So we want to replicate what is an, a true commercial environment. Picking up cars, and there's a few stud breeders here today, it's, it's, time, you know, it's time consuming and it, we just wouldn't have progeny test sites if we did that. So uh, talk to Jason a little bit how we, we still can, without actually having the birth weight, we can still get that, that great growth evaluation so we, we don't need it. But that's why we don't we don't take it. All right, hi everyone. Um, yeah, great to have the opportunity to talk to all of you today. So um, just a bit of background about myself, I guess. And um, so I'm Franzi. I came to New Zealand about four years ago initially to do a PhD um, in beef genetics. So that was with Massey University um, Abacus Bio and Beef and Lamb Genetics. And I now work as a geneticist with, with beef and lamb genetics, so a whole lot of data analysis and actually finding out ways how we can communicate the research with the wider population, really. And um, I'm actually also working two days a week on one of the Palmo farms close to Dunedin at Thornycroft, um, just to help me understand a bit more about the farming sector, just because I'm not from any agricultural background. 
but um, my role today is more to talk to you through or to talk you through some of the outcomes from the original beef progeny test that we were running. So pretty much before the project started that um, Anna and Jason have just been talking about. And um, so I'll mainly focus on maternal performance of those beef progeny test herds and um, mainly on body condition score and reproductive performance. So we ha had a whole lot of results from our, out from our research, so I w really only will focus on some of the highlights and what came out of it. And actually most of that um, research I'm presenting you today was part of my PhD. So um, in terms of beef progeny test design, I will only really touch that very lightly because I assume most of you have at some point at least heard about the project. So um, essentially the project was run on five large scale commercial farms in New Zealand. So they were spread relatively equally um, throughout the country. So we had three farms in the North Island and two in the South Island. Um, so they were all really large scale commercial operations ranging somewhere between 35,000 stock units and 90,000 stock units. Um, yeah, and that was just to cover a different range of management strategies and environmental conditions. Um, so we had quite a large variety of climates out there. Um, in terms of beef progeny test design, so the beef progeny test started in 2014 and every year they mated about 2,200 um, females by fixed time AI before the backup bulls went into the herd for a confined mating period. And um, the bull breeds, the size that they used for AI were both national or New Zealand size but also international bulls. And um, the cow breeds, oh, sorry, the side breeds that they used were Angus, Hereford, Stabilizer, Simmental, and Charolais. And in total, they used about 50 bulls per year. So I think for the duration of the project, we're now looking at about 242 bulls that were used over either Angus or Hereford cows. Um, so all progeny that were either from Simmental or Charolais sires were slaughtered, whereas all the female progeny from Angus, Hereford or Stabilizer sires were retained in the breeding herd. So the measurement program that was done on all those farms was very similar to what Anna has just described before, so I won't really get into too much detail there. But essentially all the um, steers were assessed for their finishing performance and all the heifers were assessed for their maternal performance. Um, so the heifers that went back into the breeding herd for the first two years, they were just naturally mated, and then from the third year onwards, they went into the AI herd. Um, at the moment, we're not doing any AI programs on those farms anymore, but we're currently still processing the last cohort of AI progeny. Um, but we're still measuring the females within the breeding herd on three of those farms. So what do we get? And um, yeah, here in this plot you can just see the life weight fluctuations on four of those farms. I'm only talking about four of the farms because Cabofate only really was, had um, heifers in the project and here we're actually looking at mixed age cows. And so in the graph you can see um, the solid line pretty much just represents the um, weight that was recorded on the scales, whereas the dotted line is after the effect of the conceptus was taken out, so everything removed that was associated with the calf weight. Um, and I'm just showing you that because I just wanted to demonstrate that the farms differed quite a lot in the way they used their cows and that's just represented in the way they fluctuated those life weights up and down. And yeah, some of those farms fluctuated more than others and that could be either due to different management strategies or environmental conditions. Um, so it just demonstrates that that was done under real commercial circumstances. So yeah, the, the herds are going up and down. The graph on the right now shows you the body condition score fluctuations for those properties um, recorded on a 1 to 10 scale, as Anna explained before. Um, as you can see, the body condition score follows life weight quite nicely, as you would expect. But um, yeah, that's just what those farms 
look like. Um, so I want to talk briefly about the relationship between body condition score and pregnancy rate. So that's body condition score at mating. And um, I just want to point out that we're looking at the phenotype here and not at the genotype. Um, so what you can see in this graph is the 49-day pregnancy rate. So 49-day pregnancy rate in our case was pretty much the pregnancy rate following the single artificial insemination and then allowing the cows to cycle or go through two more cycles with natural mating. Um, so what you can see here is that um, it is beneficial to have cows at least at a body condition score of around seven just to get reasonable good outcomes from um, that mating system um, to get pregnancy rates above like 90%. And this curvilinear relationship that you can see here um, just demonstrates the value of actually reducing this percentage of those low condition cows in the herd and lifting their body condition score to ensure a good outcome for those from pregnancy, for the pregnancy rate. Um, so from a management perspective, it might actually be beneficial to identify those really low condition cows as early as pre-calving even just to make sure that they get sufficient feed to ensure sufficient body condition score gain in the period leading up to mating. Um, when we actually just look at the individual AI event, so again the previous graph was just looking at AI plus natural mating, whereas this is just looking at the individual AI event at the start. And we are sort of expecting a similar relationship with a tailing off at the upper end of the scale, but what we actually saw is that the higher the body condition score was, the better was the result from the um, AI pregnancy, or from the AI program. Um, so it's actually interesting for those running AI programs, and it does also say, yeah, have them at least in a body condition score of seven to get reasonably good outcomes from um, AI programs. Um, and yeah, in that case, we were looking at AI programs only, but um, we were sort of expecting to see similar relationship if it would have been just under natural mating conditions. But how much does that actually take? And it takes about, like, to get from a body condition score of four to a body condition score of five, you need to put on about 15 kilos of life weight, whereas to get from a body condition score of seven, from seven to eight, it takes about 35 kilos of life weight. So if we just want to simplify that and actually put a straight line through that, it is about 27 kilos. So just as a rule of thumb, it takes about 27 kilos of life weight to put on one one unit of condition score. Um, yeah, and if we, especially if we remember those, that those early, those low condition scores are really relevant, it seems like especially those early kilos are to put on are well worth the investment in feed just to make sure you lift them in a good condition. Um, but what in terms of genetics? So we've talked a whole lot about um, I've talked a whole lot about the phenotype of the animals now. But is there actually anything we can do in terms of animal breeding just to make sure we can lift the body condition score of cows even more? And um, so body condition score has a heritability of 27% with reasonable variation, which pretty much just means if we look if we look at the graph here. So the graph shows you the sire variation for body condition score, so pretty much the, um, average, <coughs> the average body condition score of a sire's female progeny. And um, every bar here represents an individual sire, and the um, breed is colored differently. So what you can see here is we've got a reasonably good sire variation ranging from somewhere between 6.5 of a body condition score to 7.3. It doesn't sound huge when you think about an individual cow, but if you actually think about the entire herd and lifting the entire herd by half a body condition score, or more than half a body condition score, it's quite significant. Um, but what can we actually do with this information? Because at the moment, there are no body condition score EBVs available based on which you can really select for those animals with higher genetic merit for cow body condition score. So generally, there's this thought out there that you can select for more fat in your finishing animals with the idea to also put more fat on your cows. 
So to use that as a tool to yeah, increase body condition score of cows. But um, are those traits actually related? And if we look at those graphs, so the graphs show the um, sire progeny means for the trait rib fat depth measured at either ultrasound scanning or on the carcass with body condition score. So we found genetic correlations between 0.08 and 0.27. But what does that actually mean? It pretty much just means that at a genetic correlation of 0.27, yes, you can use the fat um, the rib fat depth EBV of, um, yeah, to, <laughs> sorry, to select for higher rib fat depth than your finishing animals with, um, and get some positive outcomes for cow body condition score as well. But it's a very blunt tool and it is not really a great predictor, so it doesn't really explain a whole lot of the variation there. Um, but the problem is, at the moment in New Zealand, it's the only tool that we really have. Um, yeah, to lift those cow body condition scores. But um, as I just wanted to point out, if we go back to the graph, where you can see here, you actually, at ultrasound scanning, you have to put on about one millimeter of rib fat depth for only a 0.13 increase in cow body condition score. Um, but if this genetic correlation actually does have an impact on the performance of the herd, also depends on where the average of your herd is actually at. So I just want to illustrate that with this graph. So the gray bars here, they represent the um, rib fat depth measures that were recorded across all the progeny within the beef progeny test. And we had an average um, of rib fat depth on the carcass of 5.4 for those ones. Um, and the industry target for that highest fat class at slaughter is between 3 and 10 millimeters, which just pretty much means as long as you're within that range, there won't be any deductions in terms of carcass value because of too little or too high fat cover. Um, but what we actually do with um, selecting for more fat in our finishing animals is pretty much just shifting that entire distribution further to the higher end of the scale. So if we think back about, um, to the low correlation between cow body condition score and rib fat depth, what that just means is that a large increase for that rib fat depth would actually be required for only a small change in cow body condition score. So it's still important to think about the rib fat depth measures of those progeny, but um, think about it more in terms of do I actually need to put any more fat on my finishing animals um, to get them to a level of finish that I'm happy with, or are they actually, do I actually think my progeny are already finishing fast enough? Um, just to wrap this up, so um, yeah, we've seen body condition score is important. Once from a management perspective, you just want to make sure that they are in a sufficiently high body condition score, especially in the period leading up to mating to make sure that you've got a high success rate um, in terms of pregnancy. But it's also important from a genetics perspective because we can't, so the fat and muscle traits and finishing animals are not really giving us a great prediction of what that animal would be like in terms of holding their condition or what the cow would be like in terms of holding their condition. And those fat breeding values should mainly be used to actually improve the performance of the finishing herd. So in that aspect, it would actually be beneficial to measure cows for body condition score and have some sort of body condition score EBVs just to be able to identify those sires with higher genetic merit for cow body condition score. Thank you, Anna. Um, so I'll start off, actually, I'm from Focus Genetics, which is a subsidiary of PAMU. Um, but it's important to make the distinction. Um, <laughs> so, so Focus runs the breeding programs for PAMU, um, and my role there is the animal breeding scientist for cattle. Um, so I was going to talk to you today about what we're planning to do with cattle at PAMU, um, particularly in our breeding programs. Um, so I think it's probably most appropriate that we start with what we're doing in our Angus program because we've got Duncraigan just down the road from here, which is our, um, our South Island Angus herd. So that herd is all about breeding for the hill country cow. 
Um, Pamu has had some contraction of the cow herd in the last five or so years. That's largely come to an end, so the cows that are still on Pamu are mostly going to stay there. Um, Do you know how many that is? It's around, I want to say 23,000. Um, plus heifers, so that's 23,000 cows calving. Um, and, you know, Palm is no different to anywhere else. Those cows are under pressure from all sorts of other land uses and they are required to return value to the farm. So they've got to be good at doing the jobs that cows do and they've got to bring value of their own accord. So our selection program is primarily it's basically driven by the Angus Pro Index, so it, it's a balance of maternal traits. Our cows have got to be fertile because rearing those heifers to drop them out after not getting back in calf after the first calf is not a place any of our farms want to be. Um, and it's got to have an emphasis on the product that they're producing. So those finishing calves that are coming out have got to be calves that are you know, going to finish in a good time, if we can get them off before the first winter, that's the goal, uh, before the second winter I should say. Um, and so that, that's our key traits, is, is maternal traits from the cow side and growth and carcass from the, the other side. Um, and we've put a decent program in place over the last few years at, at Duncraigan dealing with cow structure so a lot of our bulls go off into some really quite intense hill country properties um, so all the genetics in the world aren't any good if we're culling the cows for breaking down um, and so we're making sure that we've got a structure into the, the piece now and I think you know we've been working with Bill on that for a number of years and I think we're now at a place where actually we're really starting to see the results of that and, and most of our animals are, are grading really well for structure so that's been really good to see. Um, one of the big changes that, that Pamu is making is a commitment to keeping the majority of their surplus dairy calves for finishing. That's obviously going to have a much bigger impact in the North Island than it is here um, and also on the West Coast where there's a, a significant population of dairy cows. So we've recognised that we need to have a specific bull for that job um, and that, that if we want to make those calves really worthwhile they're, they're not going to be sired by you know the bulls that fall out of the beef breeding program so we've got using the stabiliser herd which is a composite herd that we've got up there we have taken is this going to work with both of them? Okay. Um, so using the composite herd up there we have drafted that herd two ways, so all of the bulls that, or all of the cows that are appropriate for producing, you know, being a really good dairy terminal sire, have gone into one herd, and the cows that are appropriate for being good maternal herd um, cows have gone into another herd. So the, the dairy appropriate ones, we're basically trying to produce the best terminal sire for dairy cows that we can. So that's a stabiliser base, and we've introduced some Charolais this year, um, to pump up its growth a little bit, um, low birth weight Charolais, um, and to give it a silver colour marker so that when those calves come out in the dairy herd, we can identify them. So, so that herd's becoming the silver stabiliser, um, and then the remainder of the stabiliser herd, the ones that are the more maternal types, have will line up alongside our North Island Angus program. Um, so we've still got a substantial Angus program up there at, at Kapiro and, and Rotomahana, and we've also got these stabiliser beef cows. So one of the real advantages that stabiliser gives us is they're an open, open nucleus, so we can put in anything we like into that herd um, that we think is gonna bring something helpful. So it gives us an opportunity to bring in some new traits that we might not already have within the Angus population. So, you know, we're lining up, perhaps we need to bring in some heat tolerance for some of our Northland farms. Um, so. We quite like having the, the open nucleus that we've got there. Um, in addition to all of those things, we're working on some, some new traits. So we're currently putting together plans to build 
a feed efficiency unit, um, which is going to measure both feed efficiency and, and methane. Um, feed efficiency is a pretty worthwhile trait to have in a breeding program because it means for any given level of performance we're having to put less feed in. So less feed in to get the same performance is always good um, and it has the added benefit of if less feed's gone in, less methane's coming out. Um, and we'll measure methane on those animals while they're there so that we can also identify animals that make less methane per unit of feed eaten. Um, so there's two opportunities there to, to benefit methane um, and a really big you know, opportunity for all the farmers by improving that feed efficiency of those cattle. Um, so the plan is that, that there'll be a North Island facility and a South Island facility um, and our intention is to overspec those facilities so that there's capacity for animals like these ones here at Kepler um, and other industry cattle to go through them so that you know, the measurements that we're doing there can benefit the industry as best as we can and we can use those facilities to look at proven grounds for technology and, and how we might get measurements of those traits more cost effectively throughout the industry. So um, those are probably the, the big things that we're adding to our, our program. Um, but obviously we're, we're looking at things like body condition score. We've been measuring that for a long time, so we're looking forward to a, um, an EBV for body condition score for our cows and, and a few other things that are on the horizon. Okay. Now this is going to be a question and answer session with Travis, so Travis, you better you, you better come forward, <laughs> or, else, or else I'll be asking questions and no one will be giving the answers. Um, so, and probably just really actually want to focus maybe more on um, the farm policy um, around killing animals and and how things go, um, and um, focus a little bit on that meat quality thing. Um, I'm quite passionate about the meat quality thing. Um, as I said before, I really believe in the in the premiums for meat quality, um, and um, Captain Melissa over here from Silver Fern, who I didn't really give any any warning, but she's around. So if there's um, any real specific questions about how things happen and plant and that sort of thing, uh, Melissa can um, jump in too. Um, so Travis, I guess like these animals. Um, you want to just tell us a little bit about where they are, when they when they might. Um, so I'll give, give you a minute yeah. to get your yeah. get yourself wide for sound. Okay. Um, yeah. Like, how old are they? When when do you? How have they grown so far? When do you plan to kill them? Okay. So these are. Um, so that's for the video, yeah. and this one okay. is for everyone else to hear <laughs> with. Three. Okay. So these are our first lot of AI steer cars out of yearling heifers. And they'll be coming up. So what are they now? We, we aim to kill. I've delayed the kill to the end of May because of the drives. They've had two dry events now. And so we've got a little bit behind. But they're averaging just over 500 now. So we'll whack them through now. I think things will improve pretty quickly for them now. So we might not quite make our 300 kilo carcass. But we'll get pretty close. There's no point going on with big cattle after that. But we were targeting a 300 kilo one. Which would have been no me feed on a yearling. A calf out of a yearling. Um, but they're, go they're going good. Um, so, yeah, that, and that's what we've, we, we try to target. We, we don't want anything for a second winter, if we can. Um, but we do buy in a lot of yearling cattle to finish in that uh, spring and into Christmas period. We do that, so we kill all year round, and then we do a lot of yearlings from sort of that March through to June. Um, yeah, so that's basically what we do. Policy is pretty simple. If we can feed them, feed them all the time. No hungry days. The shorter the stay, the more money we make. So that's, that's as simple as it gets, really. Grow, grow, grow. So, yeah. And if it wasn't for the dry, let's put that aside, what yeah. sort of growth rates would you be doing, would you be aiming to do per day to achieve what you want to achieve? Look, when we monitored our own cattle years ago when we were fast accelerated killing and that, and that, at that time we put 150 steers of our own cows through and they killed it. We killed them at 16 months of age at 302 kilos and we tracked them all their lives and they were only doing 800 grams a day through their lifetime. So that's winter, so, you know, 
at the, at the peaks are 1.5 and that sort of thing, in winter they're down to 500, but it averaged out to about 800 grams a day. And that, that's feeding to, yeah. yeah. And um, so that's what we've kind of specialised in, if you like, finishing yearling cattle. The heifers are the same, that's why they're on the finishing platform. Um, until they're in calf, they're, they're finishing animals. Yeah. Which uh, this year, we, it was pretty slim pickings actually. Out of 100, we put to the 108, we had four dries. So, yeah. When do you aim to So we're, we're sort of... We're so sort just, of I'll just repeat the question first, Travis, for the video. Um, Getting a thumbs up behind the video. Uh, the question was, when do you aim to calf? So we're sort of looking at that mean date, sort of that mid-October sort of thing, into October. This has delayed us a bit with the naturals and that, because we, so we end up out in November. You know, so it's quite a long carving now with the with the naturals and things. But yeah, we try to we try to get into that mean date around that October. And yeah. Not long. Not long. Not, and the, the interesting one is like I'd say we buy in a lot of yearling cattle and we do transfer in a lot off other blocks but I'll say this now that two winterings for the companies are hiding. We can make money off yearlings individually as a farm but two winters for the companies are hiding. And, and, that, and that, But each individual farm appears to make money on them, if that makes sense. Yeah. Two winters down here is, not, is an expensive business. Yeah. 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 Have you a way of figuring that round? So I can say that again. How to shift your product away from the worst time of the year to sell? So just for the for the video I'll try and repeat the question. Yeah. Um so the question was we're trying to finish animals around about the first of May and we're doing it at pretty much trying to hit the mark at the same time the rest of the Countries trying to get rid of animals as well, and so yeah, therefore yeah. tend to take a bit of a caning on price around that time. So um, the question really is, have you got any thoughts about that, any strategies to to get around that? Look, that that spacing issues become worse and worse. And I mean, that's a, that's a modern day problem, and it you know it never used to be this bad. Compounded by the dairy. Yeah, compounded by the dairy industry. It's it's yeah, it never used to be the problem it is today, and it. I mean, we're all going to have to grapple with that one. But I'd still say, even on the lower schedule, it's, it swings and balances. We take the high schedule on the yearling fellas coming through before Christmas, and we balance out on the uh, on the, the yearlings on the other side is how, how I look at it. So an average over all the animals is probably a better way to look at it. It still doesn't warrant wintering them again. So Travis, um, getting to those sort of carcass boats that you're talking about, or even doing 800 grams a day lifetime growth rate actually means you've got to keep them going through winter so do you want to talk about how you how you manage that how you achieve that yep. in your system yeah so it's an all grass wintering system for them um, it's just feeding we, we drive a wedge in front of us we do a lot of deferred grazing these older cattle like when you get them up into that sort of yearling status like the, these guys that they'll um, you know they'll, they'll go through real well on, on that rougher type feed and things like that so the yearling cattle we bring in they'll go into we'll identify the sort of more rougher type more unpalatable ones like if you like but a lot of deferred grazing um yeah just we drive that feed wedge in front of us right now tall fescue everywhere baleage into them into racks small mobs we keep those mobs pretty small our average cattle mob this year will be a bit bigger with the calves and that because we've got so many of them on we'll have over a thousand calves we'll winter about two thousand head of cattle this winter and um and, but those bigger steers, we tend to break them down to mobs, about, I try to get them under 50, and then they'll often come together in the spring into mobs of 100. But one of the, like Jason will touch on eating things, but I, I'm a big fan of animals living in their own mob, not swapping things in and out. You know, they, they have their pecking order, their social order. We try to keep that. The only time we really bring them together is when we've sort of drafted the bulk of them out of mobs and there's only a few left and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, we just try to keep feed, 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 throw more work, just keep feeding. It's cheap when it's grass. Uh, two, we do, we'll do three shifts a week on them. So they get two day shifts, no back break, out of back graze themselves, bales in every three days. So yeah, it works pretty well for them. They like no it. No portable troughs? No portable no, troughs? No, no, no. I'll, we'll go into a paddock that's designed not to pug and things, so we'll, we won't try to back break and hold them up. 
you know, otherwise you don't sleep at night when it pours down like it did last night. You'd be going, Christ, what are we going to see in the morning? But it suits the fescue anyway and the system we run yet, you know, which is another, I suppose. It's as, I suppose our system is as crucial to how we do cattle as anything, but it is almost another conversation in it. But yeah, feed, feed to. I want to come out in the spring, and these cattle don't have to do 800 grams a day, but I want them to not have strip weight, and I want them to be in forward momentum, if that makes sense. And their stomach's used to, it, it's not restricted. So, and we have a lot of clover in the spring, it's almost frightening at times, but their stomach, we figure we've fed well, their rumen's large, they come out, they've already got, they've kept fat, so they're not trying to lay it down before they grow and that sort of thing. So it's not so much a case of that they've done kilo a day or anything like that, it's that they've had some forward momentum. And the other thing to remember is, to put on weight, it's not a lot of feed above maintenance. You know, it's bugger all needed to take an animal from maintenance to above it, isn't it? And most cattle ain't fed even maintenance, so, you know, you've got to figure that out for yourselves. But we weigh a lot. But um, forward momentum is not hard to achieve, it's not a lot. So, um, maybe we should talk a little about the premium. So, obviously, you send yeah. cattle through to Silver yeah. Fern and there's the... Yeah. Um, the reserve grade thing, and I guess there's probably three things there. There's more than three things, but probably three main ones. Mm. Um, well, Melissa might tell me otherwise. Um, pH, marbling, and probably ossification as well. Mm -hmm. So, do you struggle with any of those three, or, um, or have a specific management for? Um, look, pH is a is a funny one because I've seen cattle that were so quiet. It was, they were just stupid, and I've had others go on where I seemed a bit feral, and the, and the results have flipped the other way, so I don't know, I can't get my head around pH. But we do try and full a truck, we don't try to be a part unit, we like them to just travel as their own mob and, arrive, and go straight to the works, and so we do try and do that a lot. Handling, we, we will bring them up to, into this area a couple of days before they go, onto plenty of grass so they're not getting hauled from way way down the far end is the last thing on Thursday to go Friday morning thing so we'll have them up here for a few days before they go and uh, we definitely st we'll stand them off overnight usually on one of these paddocks turned out with water in it um, but yeah our cattle are pretty quiet it, it, it's a lifetime process that you know our own cattle are the best cattle they, they, they're just it's that handling in it it's and it's not to say we we introduce all our cows and calves to dogs they've got to be able to move and they've got to know to move it. it there's nothing that'll stress out a herd more than not being at, not moving it quickly and, and easily. You know, and, that, and so that's what we, they always, we use dogs on the cows as early as we can. They know, they just move off them. Yeah. You know, that's not dogging them. I mean, we just shift them. You know, we make sure when we're brake feeding, the dogs are usually out running around, setting the calves down, have all the dogs out as you're moving the brakes and things like that. It's just, it's just getting the cattle used to their environment, really, I guess. You yard weaning? We are now. Yeah, and I like it. So the question was, are you yard weaning? Yeah. Just for the video? And yeah, and I like it. But for how long? Well, we're trying to get up to about 10 days or so we've been doing. But like, we pulled out of here with those black calves you saw of ours um, after only about a week because it was going to get too wet in here. It's just going to be hopeless. But yeah, I I've, this is the first year we've sort of done that and I like it. Yeah, I'd recommend it actually. It's a, it's a, good, it's a good way of doing it. They certainly come out settled. What we should have done, and if we had enough time, is every day we should have walked them through the yards. But, yeah. But I get the guys to bring the bailers in and get out and walk around them a bit and things like that. So, yeah, highly recommend that. Yeah. 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 No broken fences. So just for the video, that was um, Paul from Duncraig and just down the road. Um, also espousing the virtues of yard weaning, yeah. having done it for four years, you said, Paul. Um, yeah, very enthusiastic yeah. about it. Adlib baleage yeah. and, and, and just feeding your calves. And we're going as far now as the calves were buying this weaning is holding up in the yards when they arrive too doing the same thing with them. 
it just settles them down and yeah. Sorry? What kind of hit rate are you achieving? Hit rate in Oh, we were up around about 85%, but the works at, at Finnegan's, but the works have, have tightened up a bit now. I'd argue they calibrated the wrong works. They went the wrong way. But Melissa, <laughs> here's the microphone to come and, to come and tell, tell Travis what the, what the reality is. <laughs> yeah. Look, the, the problem with programs at the moment is if we get too light, if it gets too hard, you're not going to beat the fast growing thing. You're better to go, or, or you know, kill space. You, you, you're better just to go. But when you can get up around that 85 cents, you know, 85 cent in that, yeah, that's uh, that's uh, nice money in it. Oh, we always try to put cattle on programs if we can, but I'm not going to slow the system down any more for it. Do you pre-scan anything? Pre. Pre-scan. They started. That's tomorrow's job. That's uh, the start of these scanning these guys to have a look at that. So that'll be the first time they've been scanned here. So the, qu the question was, do you pre-scan anything? And, and so, Bill, just to clarify, you're meaning do you scan for marbling before you send to the works like on an animal that's going to go tomorrow? Yeah. A mob. And then pick, pick the top ones. Yeah. yeah. There was, there was work, I know the company did do work around that up, uh, um, up and around Wirria, up there they had there. They did a lot of work on, on that. But I'm not sure how good those results were for them. So, but Melissa, oh, we scan in, in the progeny test, but we scan them um, generally a bit before mm. they're killed, it's, and it's not with the idea of um, it's it's for genetic evaluation to work out how the balls are going, as opposed to which ones do we send to the mm. to the works. Because as you know, in the beef progeny test, pretty much. And this is one of the limitations um, that happens on farm, but you have an animal, you know, they're in their mobs and the mob goes. So we're not selecting, because if we do, then we start diddling with the data and we're not really comparing bulls fairly, if that's the case. So yeah, slightly different purpose, but um, same technology. Um, it's got its limitations. You know, question partly for Travis as a farmer and partly for Melissa as the processor. So you say the fast growing trumps the premium. Um, Sorry, Robert, start again. Because otherwise I'm going to have to repeat a long question. Yeah. So the, as a farmer, you're saying the fast growing trumps the premium. If you can get them up to weight and you can get space before that second winter, you're better off sending them, even if they miss out on that premium within reason. Yep. You wouldn't want to go from 100% hit to a 0% hit, but no. if you no. went from 80 to 70 but um, so, and Melissa, you're chocker with animals at that time of year. You wouldn't mind if he delayed a few um, to another time of year and kept the, you, you, the more you could get hitting the BVQ, the better, because you've got markets to fill. So the question I'm getting to is, as a processor and as a farmer, what would that premium have to be for you to focus more on the premium than on the fast finishing and it would benefit both the farmer and the processor yeah so because it's not a huge premium no and that's the problem that that, that is the reality uh, and to winter dollar a kilo if i wanted to winter an animal for you i'd want a dollar a kilo on the other side and i'd want it guaranteed yeah that's what i'd need because like in the North Island, I know of people, especially that have um, been through the beef progeny test in the North Island, growing grass in that second winter is a lot cheaper than down here. Mm. And they found it more profitable to winter them, but they were getting a much better hit rate. They weren't getting 85% in May, so they were getting a much better hit rate because age has a fair bit to do with marbling. You've got to weigh out the ossification because that you can suddenly gain your marbling but lose your ossification, but they're finding it cheaper on a, or more profitable on a cheaper grass system than you are you could down here yeah. and there are other programs that do pay more mm. but it's not guaranteed you're going to hit it um, because you still might get some that still miss out well I, I come from the north island so i farmed in the king country before i came here and a lot of that second wintering is actually about their systems it's not so much that there'll be certain guys targeting things but it's actually the way they winter cattle 
it, it's nothing to do with not wanting them gone as yearlings, they just winter cattle like that. South Island's become very good at, at once wintering because they know the cost involved in wintering. In the north, it's more they're ready when they're ready type system. So, Melissa, from a processor's point of view. Oh, thank you, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> Um, just for those who don't know me, I know quite a number of people here. Um, Melissa Sardin and work for Silver Fern Farms. I'm in the Agri Business team. Um, for all of my sins, I've been involved with the dairy progeny trial and the beef progeny trial, and now coming forward with um, the informing New Zealand beef um, stuff. Um, but I've also wear many hats, but um, pretty much like from a livestock farmer point of view the the key contacts um, around our beef eating quality system um, at the plant so just a little bit about me but um you had a lot of questions there robert um first one talking about north island to be fair most of our north island suppliers are nearly three winters they, they are not two year olds that come through from a processing point of view so that's probably the first thing i I do want to to mention we generally find in the South Island that a lot of the suppliers that sending livestock to us really are when we're starting to talk about a true 18 month probably through to a 24 month old um, animal that comes through to us um, if I'm putting on a real processor's hat on um, and this is where there's a real sort of tension point um, around supplying animals into a processor is a and we all know this and and this year is without doubt been probably the worst that everyone's come across is is space and, and availability but also b is we actually have to think about our end product getting it to market and we need it on a shelf life for 12 months of the year so that is gives us a real um, hard balancing act, particularly the further south of the, the country we move because we think of a grass curve and we're trying to meet a grass curve to finishing our animals. So it is a, is a real tension point. And to Travis's point about a dollar, we're, we're getting closer. Every year we seem to be moving our premiums up a little bit more. We're not at a dollar, but um, we're definitely starting to get a lot more closer, particularly for that, that winter period. So. I know for here in this system um, that doesn't suit it, but I can tell you, hand on heart, if we're talking about from a processor's point of view, when we want cattle finished, the A, the hardest to get really good in quality spec animals, and when we really need them would be there August, July, August, September, moving into October. Because the rest of the year, it's a hell of a lot easier because you guys have generally got a really good um, grass curb. Any other questions? Not a question, but a comment that. Oh, shit. Um, oh. Oh. <laughs> was that? Was I was to go get that one. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want a beanie, Travis? I've got a silver fin farms one on my head. No, I'll go, I'll um, go just a comment. Probably the worst thing you can oh, do from a meat quality point of view is get animals to a weight and then hold them over oh, no, until they get I'll that get premium and kill them in August, September without them having been going forward. So, from a pH point of view, um, probably from a marbling point of view as well, um, from a meat quality point of view in general that's the worst thing you can do and yet it's probably done quite a bit i bet you a bunch of the cattle that you see in august haven't grown much since june so there are some people doing it well on pot of eat and yeah they're actually piling the weight on and the marbling on yeah and, and again to travis's point um particularly when we're talking about eating quality the, the there's two there's three things i always um, mention to farmers if they're questioning around what their eating quality is and how that they've graded out and stuff and to Travis's point those animals have got to be moving forward without doubt you have to make sure that they're fed and you're really really pushing them forward that's going to be the, the next thing the second thing when it comes through to us we actually need that um the animal to be prime and so saw quite a cool graph um in the in the shed earlier on today um we're really looking for peas that that's where we can get um, um adamant um we can get additional value for you guys in market we don't want them to we don't want t's and we don't want s and we definitely don't want l so those animals have to be prime and then um the third point is it comes down to genetics so we've got to feed them they've got to be finished and and then we're really looking at that genetic component no, thank you Thanks. yeah yeah, so I always think about marbling anyway, it's actually a multiplicative equation. It's, um, it's nutrition times genetics times carcass weight. So 
if any one of those is zero, your sum is zero. Um, it's the way I like to think about it anyway. Thanks, Anna. Um, <coughs> we're going to talk about the structure of the assessing, um, but first, Judy and I farmed for 37 years, I think, on our own account. Bred uh, cattle, breeding cattle was a passion, um, along with some sheep, um, but then we moved over for family and, and what have you and a change of lifestyle, and we've been on the road for the last 16 years uh, scanning cattle and the last uh, 12 or 13 years doing some structure. The structure's built a lot in the last, well since before COVID, we'll blame COVID I suppose, like everybody else does, um, but once people started not being able to travel and the bull sales went online, um, then our requests for our services were increased um, because basically what structural assessing does, it puts a set of data down beside an animal and so you, you don't have to go and see the animal to get an idea of how it's set up on its feet and legs. Um, you've got the EBVs and, and the pedigree that you know and everything else, whether you like it or don't, but then um, I'm independent, I don't have a financial interest in any cattle, um, and we do a large number now. We've been the last four weeks on the road, we got 10 hours at home the other day, that's the first time we've been there in four weeks, um, thanks to the ferry largely. Um, but we've still got another three weeks to go and all those bull sale catalogues that have got that data in them, you, you can rely on that to tell you what, what the animal is. I don't tell you whether the animal's good or bad, I describe the animal with those set of numbers. It's a system primarily laid down by Armidale University in Australia and it works pretty well. Um, we've got two heifers here, uh, obviously first cross Angus Hereford, I'm not sure whether they're from the same uh, sire or, and dam or whether it's opposite, one by a Hereford and one by an Angus. But anyway, they're reasonably similar in size and weight. Um, but one of those animals, I would, if it was a bull, I would absolutely use in my herd and if it was a heifer, I'd keep. The other one, there's no way I'd keep it in my herd. Who, who thinks uh, heifer number 65 is the best? Just put your hand up, just give us an indication. 65 is this one, 69 is the other one. Anyone like 65? That's good. Everybody likes 69? Because there's, there's a huge difference between those two heifers and their structural assessment score and, and their longevity and everything else. Um, we'll talk about longevity later. It's not one of my favourite words. but um, The heifer here, 65. Come here, girl. She's pretty ordinary. If you watch her front, the way she uses her front legs and the way she pulls up. She's pulled up there now with her um, knees in, feet turned out. Um, and that's going to wreck her claw set and, and everything else. That's, and, and that tightens up her front, that affects her constitution, her doing ability. Um, and she's just not very good in that front end at all. The other heifer, you don't have to be in front to see it. She's standing there with her legs apart and her straight up and down and her feet pointing forward. And so structural assessment will describe those two animals. The front view, five, sorry, five is perfect. And it's a system that goes both ways from five. Um, the heifer, the back heifer is a five for front view. This near heifer is, is a seven for front view because she's in and out. If she was a four for front view, then she'd be pigeon toed and her um, her knees would be out and her toes would be in, and that's another whole different ball game again. Um, cattle don't vary a lot in that front, the vast majority are fives in the front, but we do see the front like on this animal, um, and we do get a, f a few, as we put more muscle on our traditional cattle, um, we are seeing more four, uh, score four and three in the front, and that's to be avoided as well. Um, but we'll just let her out the poor one out and we'll have a look at the other one on her own. And this heifer's, heifer's pretty good all round. We've, we've, first thing we do is the front view, then we look at the claw set which is the amount of curl or lack of in the front claw and the rear claw. And as she comes round she's pretty good, they're, they're reasonable. a little bit of curl is natural, you get the odd one that's dead straight but 
she's good enough for a five on that front claw set. And if you look just at the, at the amount of curl or lack of, she's pretty straight. They're fairly close together. If she was a four, they would be apart, but they would still be straight. The curl in the scoring system overrides the straightness, and a four is perfectly acceptable to me because it's generally short on the ground. Um, but she's a nice five there, and she's straight enough on the rear claw for a five. But the important one for me is the amount of heel. Um, it's called hoof angle on the sheet, um, and that's the depth of heel at the back of the hoof from the hairline to the ground. And you can see that heifer there. Um, while it's not a five, that's a six. That's very natural and what we see a lot of and very functional. If she had slightly more heel would be better, but those feet will still wear. What, what the heel does is when the animal's walking, if there's enough heel there, they will wear their toes as they walk. And so the animal will stay sound with short feet. If it doesn't have enough heel, and I'll show you in a minute on some of these others, then the hooves get long and grow and break and crack and end up with lame cattle. The rear heel there I'd like to see a little bit more, but she's better than a, than a lot we've, we're seeing. Um, she's a perfectly functional animal, even though she's not getting a lot of fives, she's still a very good hoofed animal and she will stay sound. The other score we give is a side view, and she's pulled up there nicely for those over that side to see. We need angle in the back leg for, be, for being able to walk properly and easily. Um, if we don't, if we have too much angle, she will overstep when she walks. When she walks, she puts her back foot in where her front feet leave, and that's a perfect five. If she slightly oversteps or half a hoof oversteps, she'll get a six, and that's perfectly all right, and a lot of New Zealand English bred cattle are like that, and they tend to be good cattle to walk around the hills, no problem. But once you get into a four, which is a straighter back leg, and to indicate that when they walk, the back feet doesn't get as far forward as the front feet, when you get an animal like that, then you're gonna get into bother with broken stifles and things with bulls, um, and they won't move around the hill the same. What happens, an animal's got that amount of angle in its arm, on its hock, when it, a bull mounts a cow, so he's on two legs and he's straightened it a bit. When he goes to serve that cow, if, if his leg is straight and it's like this once he's on the cow, as he goes to serve the cow there's nothing left. And so something's got to break and it's generally the stifle or he won't get it. Um, so a straight leg is to be avoided because as soon as a bull breaks a stifle he's never going to serve another cow. And so traditionally our English bred cattle are very good in that department. We do see some fours. We found a steer this morning that was marginally that way, but nothing else. As a line, they were very good in that department. There were some that were sixes uh, that were overstepping, but not to the extent that you'd cull them. And then we get into a rear view, and a rear view is like the front. We want it apart. We want it straight. Um, we don't want it cow hocked, although a six, and I think I scored her a six, she is slightly in from straight up and down, and that's pretty acceptable and pretty normal in our cattle, um, and that doesn't have any restrictions or costs to it. Um, but if you've got a bandy leg from behind, which would be a four or a three, if we're getting into a three, then he's 100% unsound, because once a bull mounts a cow, and once again he's got all that weight once he gets past two year old and he's got all that weight on his hocks and they're facing outwards all the weight comes down on them, them when he does the job and generally they blow out and after half a dozen cows served he'll be lame for the rest of the mating season and he might even be still lame next mating season so your hocks out are to be avoided hocks in are okay so long as they're not too close if an animal we had a few here today that were, when they walk away from you, they were cow hocked, um, but as they placed their foot, they placed one in front of the other, and that's too narrow. It's like that heifer we put out too close in the front, it's too close behind, lacks constitution and doing ability. So she's pretty good and she's a benchmark to work off. We'll put her back and bring one of the other two, and, or, or both of them, it doesn't matter. 
we do temperament as well in the score in both males and females. For an EBV, the temperament has to be done like was stated inside um, at weaning time. Um, I do do a temperament score now, or that one that's done at weaning time or under 400 days can be used and is used for creating EBVs for temperament. When I'm structurally assessing bulls in the autumn now, I give them a temperament score as well. That doesn't go towards their EBV, but it tells you, the bull buyer, what that bull is like. Because at the end of the day, um, that animal doesn't know me. He comes, all the cattle I assess comes into the pen one at a time, and it's the only time in their life that that animal is on its own, away from its mob. So it's a pretty tough test of an animal's temperament and the cattle here today were very good. The vast majority were, um, one, being a university system, obviously something has to be backwards, and so temperament's backwards. One is perfect, five is a killer. Um, one is like these cattle here, I can get into the corner and put, hold it in there with my stick and get my hand on it. She didn't want to cooperate, the last one did. Where girl? But I can, I can control her and hold her in the corner, and, and that's a one um, for me, or you could take her down to a one and a half, because she's just keeping off me a little bit. A two would walk round and round in the pen, not comfortable with me holding them in the corner or getting on top of them, but still perfectly controllable. A three is going around here fairly quick, uh, um, and got his head up and bright and alert in the eyes. A four um, is looking to climb out, um, and a five, well it's aggressive, it's having a go at me and I've noticed it coming through the gate into the pen and I'm already climbing up the fence because it's, it's wanting to kill me. Um, and you need to learn to recognise temperament, um, especially in my job. But getting back, and the, the other thing we do before we get on to the poor animal, um, the other thing we do with bulls is we score the sheath. Um, the sheath for a five is tucked up neatly under the belly. There's not a great deal of skin there. In fact, generally no skin apart from the round end. And it, it, that skin is shaped pointing forward like my stick. Um, a four will have a little bit more skin um, onto the, towards the navel and may still got that sort of angle, hopefully. Um, but once you get into a three, you're talking about six inches or more of skin down from the body, and quite often he's pointing straight up and down. Um, the reason for taking notice of that is a, a four and a five are very acceptable. Some people prefer fours, some prefer fives. Um, that's no problem, I would use either. A three with the extra skin and the direction not as good. If your bull's got on a single sire mating program, and he's got five heifers on this morning, he, it's harder for him to do the job. He mounts the cow um, and he's got to control himself to enter the cow, whereas the four or the five mounts the cow, he's straight in there. Um, whereas a three, he's got to do a lot more work to get her served, and so he can get tired after two or three heifers and he might miss the other two and has to get them the next time around. It's, it's about a confined mating and getting maximum number in calf in a confined mating is what the score represents. Um, a three is okay. If everything else in that bull is fantastic and it's a three, and I'd, I'd still use it, um, but I wouldn't touch a two. So you're saying a four and a five is good, is that the way around? Yes. Yeah, five's the best, four is next, and a three is marginal. Um, a three's still functional and usable, but in a stud situation, unless everything was fantastic, I don't think I'd use a three. But in a commercial sense, in multi-sire mating, you get away with a three, you might buy them a bit cheaper. But a, a two is, uh, you've all seen a picture of a Brahmin or a um, Santa Gertrudis, that's a, a genuine two and, and some of them are ones for, for um, sheath and um, at the end of the day their fertility in the Northern Territory uh, leaves a lot to be desired beside our confined matings and seasonal matings. They're not, they don't want that, they want a, a spread out mating and, and going through the seasons quite different to our conditions. And so we need to keep an eye on that. And credit to the Hereford and Angus breed in particular, 
when we first started breeding cattle, the sheets were terrible. The national um, beef uh, sales there in Palmerston North, there'd be bulls there almost dragging on the ground. Um, now you don't see much of that at all. And I think we worked out in the car the other day, we, we aren't scoring uh, anywhere more than about 10% at, at three. The rest, the 90% are fours and fives. The breeders have done a heck of a job of improving that. Right, we get back to feet, and if you look at, we look at the, the front view is fine, but if we look at the front claws, they're not great on her. They've got more curl than either of what we've had. They're long, and they curl, and the rear curls as well. But the indicator of how bad they are is when you look, and, and that's, I gave her a seven for both front claw and rear claw. I could live with those scores, especially I could live with a seven on the front. I couldn't live with a seven on the rear, but the biggest problem I couldn't live with is the hoof angle. And if you look at her rear hoof in particular, there is no heel. That's as flat as flat on there, and those feet are going to continue to grow every day she eats feed. And so by the time she's two and a half, weaning her first calf, they will have either broken off or split and she's gone lame. Um, she's an out and out cull on her feet. Um, and if if you're looking at a bull sale catalogue and there's a bull there that says it's seven for claw set and seven for hoof angle, my personal recommendation is you don't touch it. If it's got an eight, most stud breeders cull them. They don't make the sales. Not many make the sale that are seven and seven on one set of feet, whether it be the front or back. Um, not many make it, but you'd want to be determined to have that animal to buy it with feet that are, that are scored like that. You can handle a, a seven on the front claw, um, but for hoof, and you could handle an animal that's a six on the front claw and a seven for angle there, but if it's a double seven, you'd want to look really closely at it um, because it's not likely to stay sound. And the other protection for the stud breeder, which I believe is if you're the commercial buyer buying those bulls and I've said that animal's a seven and a seven and he publishes that in the catalogue underneath that animal in six months time after you've put that bull out and bring it back in in January or February and the bull's feet are crook, I don't think you've got to come back because I've described the animal and the breeders published it and you've bought that animal with your eyes open, the data's there, all you've got to do is read it. You don't necessarily have to see the animal. So be careful, L read the data. It can cost you money if you don't, and it can save you money if you do. For me, everything we do here in structural assessing is about, I'm not culling the animal as such, I'm describing it, although some places we do cull them on the day that we're doing it. Um, but I'm actually describing the animal to you or whoever else and so that information's there. I'm not telling you it's bad or good. It's for you to work out whether that's acceptable in your breeding program or not. And everything I talk about is either going to make you money or cost you money. There's no fads, nothing else. It's making money or costing money. Anything else is completely irrelevant in my opinion. Do we have any questions on that? We'll swap her over with the Hereford. We've been PC today. We've got one of each that's bad. And in the crossbreedings, we've got one good and one bad. And you have to admit the temperament of these cattle is outstanding. Um, there'd only be, of the 100 plus that we did this morning, there would only be three or four that I couldn't, I wouldn't have put here in front of a crowd that would have played up a bit. They're outstanding. Um, and your first impressions are important and when an animal walks in if you're looking at if you're interested in how their feet are then look at their feet as they walk across you and look at their heel depth or hoof angle and straight up you've got an impression as to whether the animal's any good or not and and the first impression is she's not um, because if she's got that heel depth everything else falls into place you can tolerate a bit more curl in the claws if she's got heel depth because while it's got curl it won't get any worse because they will wear um, they'll still have some curl 
but that she won't break down and, and let you down. Whereas an animal like this, like the previous one, there is no heel on there. The heel line is touching the ground at the back of that rear hoof. Um, there's obviously a bull in the trial that is leaving that because I could find you two or three heifers like that, Hereford, and two or three blacks and two or three crossbreds that are exactly the same and there was the same half dozen animals in the steers. So there's a bull or a pair of bulls or a line of females that has got it in it that is giving us that. And every herd has it. It's a matter of getting the biggest percentage good. But if you look at her claws in the front, they're curly and they're long. Her rear claws, this outside claw on this side is because of the lack of heel has grown that far that it's almost crossing over the inside claw and it will by the end of the season. That toe is up, it'll come across and grow past the inside claw and they'll break, she'll get an infection, she'll get lame and so consequently she probably won't milk very well for her calf. But a lovely heifer body wise, got everything we want in the rest of her but those feet will let her down um, as to produce a calf for five or six years. Um, and the other thing when you're looking behind her, she's very close in those hocks, she turns out and the feet low down, when she walks straight away from you, she's a full on seven or worse. Um, and she's inclined to walk and place one rear foot in front of the other as she walks away like she's walking a tightrope. Um, and that, that's lack of constitution um, and lack of functionality really. The, Structural assessing, like I said before, describes an animal, um, but it's not, it's, for me, I don't like the term structural soundness that a lot of stud breeders use. For me, the term is functional. So long as the animal is functional and there's nothing too bad in there that's going to cost you money, then I, if she's going to produce me the most money, then she's staying at my place. It's only about money for me. and. So long as she is functional and the most productive animal, then she's mine. But if she's going to got a fault that's going to cost me money, then she's off the place. And that's, that's my only criteria. Um, and when you get into um, coat colour, um, swirls of the coat that was um, all the go there a few years ago, um, there's been all sorts of fads. Um, and none of them produce you more or, or indeed cost you anything but if you're going to select for those things they're going to slow your progress down on the things that are going to make you money and cattle breeding slow by nature anyway and so we don't need a handicap. Did I mention temperament to this group or not? Yep, good. Maybe on the temperament, Bill, you can talk about the eyes now, yeah. the eye placement. Um, <clears throat> part of my upbringing was with great uncles uh, and great aunts, and uh, they were cattle dealers. Um, they bred cattle, but they were primarily cattle dealers. And one of them, when we were going away to buy my first bull, said to me, now you've got to make sure his eyelashes are down, they're not pointing up. And I, I was pretty young, and I thought he was pulling my leg. Um, and I didn't take a lot of notice. But the more I see, the more he's 100% correct. What we need for a quiet animal, and every one of these is quiet, we want a bone hood over the eye, so the eye is in the head, and we want the eyelash out and down over the eye. As soon as you see a cattle beast with an eyelash pointing up, I guarantee the eye is outside the head. And those cattle, every shadow that flicks, every leaf that blows, or a bird that flies out past them, gives them a fright and they're unsettled and they are wild cattle as a, as a rule. There's the odd exception to the rule but largely I'm still alive because I look at the eyes as that animal comes through the gate when I'm doing this job and if that eye's like that I know I can relax and walk around in front of it. I, I haven't been hit but I've gone up the fence a few times um, but generally a wild or sturdy animal is an animal that the eyelash is up and it's only up because the eye is outside the head. So if you've got a bone structure hooding the eye, and when you look around at the people standing beside you, we've all got a bone hood over our eye. Our eye's not stuck outside our head, and neither should a cattle beast. And 
these, these cattle have been outstanding. You look at the white face down there. Um, you've got a bone hood quite prominent over top of that eye. The more you look at cattle, the more you'll see the difference. Um, the question of longevity came up before. Um, I'm not a fan of the term. Um, in fact, I believe the ultimate longevity actually costs you money, which goes against my philosophy. Um, but when I say that, I qualify it in that I want a cow to be structurally sound enough to produce six or seven calves. But after that, if you've been doing your, running your breeding program properly, her daughter should be producing better cattle than she is. And so therefore, something has to give. At weaning time, either the old cow goes or the heifer goes. And for me, if that cow's delivered me six or seven calves, the cow goes because the heifer has to be better if you've done the job right. And the, hef the daughter's steer, steer hanging on the hooks will be better than the steer hanging on the hooks from the mother. And so I don't like the term longevity. I like the term functional. And to, to lift a herd, you have to have a certain amount of generation turnover and to lift your performance and the, all the studs with all the EBVs and the recording they've been doing over the years and the prax cattle, if you look at the trend graphs and things, if you want to lift that quicker, you kill the bottom 20%. You'll make a heck of a difference to your trend graph. And a lot of that bottom end are your old cows. Even though they bring in a good calf at weaning time, um, it's that, that old cow shouldn't, shouldn't have as good a genetic makeup as the young cow. There will always be the odd exception, but as a general rule, the majority should go. We did a lot of work for a guy for 10 years in South Australia, and um, we took over, a, it was a purebred herd there that was single sire mated, not recorded, but single sire mated, so we knew what was everything was by. And um, they were supplying straight into the feedlot, and the lift in production there over a, a cycle and cutting the generations down, Okay, he was prepared to spend money on good bulls, but the lift was huge. Bill, in the last group, and because we're just nearing the end, uh, you touched on muscle and also shoulders. So if you could yep. touch on that, particularly for the video, that would be great. Thank you. Just to, um, to eyeball an animal like I've spent 16 years scanning, um, it's a privilege really. We don't go in and criticise a person's cattle or... or like a stock agent go in and talk to them about selling a bull we actually get the privilege of measuring those cattle and the bullshit stops on the screen um, but there's some indicators that I've learnt and I learnt from a butcher in Sydney who sourced an awful lot of cattle um, and scanning there's some indicators for carcass and at the end of the day I'm about carcass and and that and so we want the shoulder blades at the top of the animal not she's she's the best of these three just apart like so we don't want the shoulder blades up together above the spine or the spine above the points of the shoulders like a, a if you visualize a Frisian cow or a Jersey cow they're not designed to give you muscle but their shoulder blades are up like so and the spine is up above them um, and they don't have muscle to get muscle we need the shoulder blades apart um, the other indicator is we need the point of the hip down off the back line. When you're looking at the animal side on, and she's not a bad example, the point of her hip is below her spine. The further that um, hip, uh, pin, uh, hip bone is down, the more muscle through the top. And the reason I say that is, in the past our industry has been based on hind quarter. Before we had any data and measurements, it was based on hind quarter. Hind quarter is 30% of that carcass when it's hanging up. It's only 10% of the retail value in that carcass. The money is in the back straps. And to get that extra back strap, you've got to have width in the shoulder and the hip bone down off the spine. And an animal like that will always have muscle in the top of it, and that's your expensive cuts. It's not going to make you any more money when you sell over the over the scales at the freezing works but at the retail end it's going to make a lot more money and from an EBV point of view I don't uh, I like to see uh, a, a ribeye breed average or better 
but the figure, two figures I take the most notice of outside of carving ease is carcass weight, because carcass weight's what you're paid for. Every animal you send to the works, whether it be a sheep or a cattle beast or a pig, you're paid for carcass weight. That's your base payment. Whatever the schedule is or the bonus is above schedule on that carcass weight, that's what you're paid for. And so the carcass weight for EBV figure is a very accurate figure on what a bull will do to you and his progeny. And the other figure, if you're in the market for a bonus, which I believe we all should be, and Jason Archer intimated that down there before, in the quality end of the market, and we should be marketing to the wealthiest 1% of the world, and that incidentally is 80 million people, and we can only feed 25 million, so it's a pretty big uh, niche market that we can supply that's got extra money, um, but your premium comes from your intramuscular fat, your IMF, which translates into marbling, and so your carcass weight's your base payment, your intramuscular fat's your bonus payment. Yes, you've still got to have a low pH and meat and fat colour, but you can't control those outside of temperament for your pH, but you can control the amount of IMF in, and you can control the amount of carcass weight in there. And at the end of the day, if an animal hasn't genetically got intramuscular fat, it won't give it to you no matter how much you feed it, because 10 times nothing still comes out at nothing. Yeah, IMF is 32%. Uh, retail beef yields up to around 60. Um, rib fat, I think, is around 40. It's in. Uh, I, I'm not sure. It should be the same in Hereford and Angus. I'm, I'm familiar with the Angus graph, um, but they are highly heritable. So at the end of the day, if you do three generations, if you imagine three glasses of water, 32% full. So they're, what's that, 68% empty. And I'm a glass half full person. And so you do three generations of 32%. If you put any more in, it'll overflow. If you tip them all into one. So three generations, you'll lock it in. After one generation, you'll get about a 50% improvement. After two, you'll be up around 75. And once you've done three generations of a disciplined breeding program, where you don't get carried away with something you like the look of, but you stick to a data set, you'll guarantee it's there. It has to be disciplined. I got asked about um, length in the last crowd and I'll, I'll show you. Um, I Personally, I think length in a cattle beast, and we, people talk about length, but personally I think it's a bit of an optical illusion. Um, that heifer doesn't look hugely long because she's quite deep. And at the end of the day, the distance between my two hands, that, that piece of paper is reasonably deep. But as soon as you fold it in half, that piece of paper is long. And the same applies to a cattle beast. You shallow a cattle beast up, and it'll look long all right, but it, there's not much animal there. It's an op length basically is an optical illusion in my mind. We do, I don't do any yearling bull sales, but we do a heck of a lot. We've done the last uh, five, uh, four weeks away, we've got another two to three weeks every day. We had 10 hours at home the other night, thanks to the ferry. That's the first time we've been home in a month, um, doing this age group. Um, partly because we want that extra weight to show it. Um, that's why we don't do yearling bulls. These heifers are far enough on. Some heifers at the moment I wouldn't do till May, June. Um, to get a bit more maturity in them, but these heifers are well far enough on in nice condition and the, and the differences are showing as you can see here today. Um, you can do yearling heifers about mating time, but it's, it's not as reliable as doing it now. Ideally, if you thought you had a problem with your females in the herd, I'd do it, um, and you wanted to do it before you were getting rid of cows in the autumn, I'd do it after the bulls came out. When they're in real, as good an order as you can get them in with a decent amount of weight before you start abusing them, using them to eat a cliff face out or clean up after use or what have you, D do them then R rather than pre-mate. Yep, the other comment, um, Jason and I have done two or three field days together and um, I don't know whether he pinched 
um, the comment about the free lunch and crossbreeding off me or whether I got it off him, but it's a comment I use and 100% believe in. Um, but the other one, which is a pure Jason quote, and he won't mind me using it, I've used it on several different occasions, is when you're buying bulls for your commercial herd, it's not the individual bull you buy in that herd that matters, that will be your biggest financial decision. It's the driveway you choose to drive up. That's your biggest financial decision because you're going to mirror that program one generation down. And so it's the program you buy into that will be your biggest financial um, influence rather than the bull you buy in that program. And Jason says that at different field days and, and he's 100% right in my mind.